Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I uh, would first obviously like to thank the organizer, and especially Kurata Sensei for the invitation. I enjoyed very much the youth program. It was fantastic. Thanks to the students too for having me. And uh, it was really a pleasure. And I'm sure these two days will still be a big pleasure. So during my talk, I will give you a sort of historical overview of what we have done on this uh, uh, Drosophila immune system. And I will give you a little story we came up more recently. So I hope I will stay on time. So uh, Drosophila belongs to the, we probably know that, to the holometabolous insect here. And like all other invertebrates in yellow, it defends itself against microbes by a pure innate immune system. There are no B or T cells, there are no antibodies, and you certainly know that uh, the, the adaptive immune system with the B and T cells antibodies arose roughly 500 million years ago with the arrival of a rack transposon in the germline of this first jawed vertebrate here. But the important message here is that uh, this uh, um, innate immune system works together in vertebrates with an adaptive immune system. And this uh, adaptive immune system interests roughly only 5% of extant animals. And this means that 95% of all animals uh, use a pure innate immune system. So if you look at the immune system, there are two arms. And uh, there is a cellular arm and a humoral arm. And the cellular arm was discovered first by Ily Mechnikov, who got the Nobel Prize in 1908 because he discovered phagocytosis in, star, in starfish. And the humor, uh, uh, for the humor arm, um, arm, we have to go back to 1920, a little bit later, where Glaser, Metalnikov, and uh, especially Payot, working in Lyon in France, discovered that there were antimicrobial substances in the blood of insects. And we followed, starting in the 80s, we, we followed, in fact, the, the, the traces of, uh, of, of Payou. And uh, we used insects because we, we knew that insects are um, evolu evolutionarily successful. They live in all kinds of very dirty conditions. And uh, I have nothing against McDonald's, don't worry. But uh, they, even if they live in these dirty conditions, they, they are incredibly resistant to infections. And we wanted to know why they are so, uh, so uh, resistant. And so this is an overview of the system. So insects have a hard uh, exoskeleton, a hard cuticle. And inside, you have an open circulatory system. And obviously, when this cuticle is breached, it means danger for this uh, soft tissue which are inside here. And the animal will answer with several kinds of responses. Again, a cellular response in which hemocyte blood cells are engaged in phagocytosis or capsule formation. And you have the humoral response, which can be subdivided into an early step, activation of proteolytic cascade, like the phenol oxidase, the coagulation, and there is even a complement cascade. This is an early step. This is generally just to seal the hole here. And this is followed by the main systemic response. And uh, this systemic response is due to the synthesis of this antimicrobial peptide by the fat body. Fat body in insects is an equivalent of our liver. So we have mainly worked on this uh, systemic response. And the first question is always, how do you breach the cuticle? How do you challenge the animals? So I did a little movie to show you that it's very simple. We, take a, a, a concentrated culture of bacteria, a little needle, and you just challenge like that the animal. It can take gram-positive, gram-negative, fungal spores, whatever you like. But I have to say it's easy, but uh, when we started, I explained yesterday, sometimes we use 10,000 10, flies at a time to do a single extract. And we, in the process, we lost a few students. So. When you do that, you see very easily the appearance of this antimicrobial activity in the blood of the insect. Starts three hours after the challenge, levels up up to 24 hours, reaches a plateau, and finally will decrease. It does not exist in control animals. And I told you this is due to this antimicrobial peptides. And we have studied this in a, starting in the 80s. 
uh, in the 1980s uh, in a sort of, I like to call it, centrifuge way. We have started by uh, looking at the effector molecules, the peptides themselves. We have then switched onto the control of expression of the genes encoding these peptides. And finally, uh, the recognition. How does insect recognize that the bacterium entered its body cavity? So first, the peptides. There are uh, four families of antimicrobial peptides active against gram-negative bacteria, diptericin, atacin, drosocin, and cecropin. And here you have listericin. We missed it, and it was uh, uh, discovered a little bit later by Kurata-sensei. Uh, I have to say, very nicely, in a very nice work. Uh, insect defensins are active against gram-positive bacteria. And finally, drosomycin and mechlicovin are active against fungi. But the main message here is that all these peptides are synthesized upon microbial challenge. They are inducible peptides. They are excreted into this open circulatory system where they directly kill microbes. The concentration are largely enough. They act like detergent. And, but you can see that drosomycin here, 100 micromolar. You need 10 to the 6 molecule to kill a single bacterium. But there are enough. And here you see the effect of, e. coli, of a treatment of E. coli by defensin. These are human defensin, but it would be the same for insect peptide. And you can see that five minutes after the contact, the, the bacterium leaks out and will die. So I don't want you to remember all these peptides, but just remember for the uh, rest of my talk, diptericin, uh, which is uh, our prototype of antibacterial peptide, and drosomycin, which is our prototype of antifungal peptide. So the first gene we cloned, this was in the 80s, uh, we, when we sequenced is a diptericin gene. When we sequenced uh, rather painfully at that time the, the promoter, we found that there were two kappa B response elements here. And using transgenic fly lines, like here, we could show that this kappa B response element were absolutely mandatory for the inducibility of the gene. At that time, NF kappa B was known already. It had been uh, uh, discovered by uh, David Baltimore, who got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Uh, it was known for its role in the adaptive immune system. But in the fly, there was only one NF kappa B like molecule known, and this was a product of a gene called dorsal. <coughs> And this was known because dorsal is uh, required for the setting up of the early dorsal ventral axis in the drosophila embryo. <coughs> Sorry. So how does this work? Here we are in the ventral part of the embryo. You have uh, the uh, tiny little space, which is called the perivitellin space. You have uh, the eggshell, which is here, and the follicular cell. And at time of fertilization, uh, through the product of these two genes here, there is a ventral cue that activates in a way that we still don't really understand. In, but it activates a cascade of four serine proteases, a little bit like uh, the coagulation system in our blood. And this culminates with the activation of this serine protease called ester. Ester, in turn, will cleave this molecule here called Spetzler. Spetzler belongs to a family of... Uh, 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 cytokines and, and, uh, and uh, growth factor in which you have also uh, NGF, it's homologue of NGF, the nerve growth factor. So Spetzler becomes the active ligand of TOL and uh, of the receptor here called TOL and in turn TOL will transduce the signal onto the complex here uh, in which you have NF kappa B, dorsal, and uh, I kappa B, uh, the fly homologue is called cactus. So cactus is degraded, dorsal is free to translocate to the nucleus, where it activates zygotic genes, telling this cell to become ventral and uh, the embryo to put in this place its belly. And so this pathway was known. Uh, it was called the toll pathway because of the central role played by, by the toll receptor here. And it had been discovered a little bit earlier by uh, uh, Christian Nistlein Follard, uh, who got the Nobel Prize in 95 for this discovery. <coughs> and so we asked the mutants, we had mutants uh, here, and so we asked the mutants from, from Yanni, and she gave us the mutants, and we checked the immune system in these mutants. And we did it at that time by a very simple northern blot. And here you can see this is the wild-type inducibility of drosomycin, diptericin, 
And here you can see that in a tall minus background, you have now lost the inducibility of the azomycin. But dipterycin remains wild type. And this showed us that uh, the tall receptor, tall pathway, controls the expression of the azomycin. But what about dipterycin? At the same time, uh, by pure chance, and I told you yesterday to the student that luck is very important. This was pu purely by chance. We found another mutation that we called uh, IMD for immune deficiency. And you can see now that in an uh, IMD loss of function background, you have lost the inducibility of dipterycin, but drosomycin remains white type. And so we, this led us to propose for the first time that there are two pathways which control the expression of antimicrobial peptide genes in these fat body cells. The first pathway is IMD pathway, which uh, controls the expression of dipterycin and also more than 100 genes. We have shown that later by, by microarray. And the second pathway is the toll pathway. It's used by the early embryo to set up its dorsal ventral axis and later reused by the adult fly to control the expression of dosomycin and also uh, uh, more than 100 genes. And I want just to point your attention to, to here because uh, the, we could show at the same time that the proteases which are required in the early embryo are not required for the expression of dosomycin. But let me show you the, uh, the historical outcome of this discovery. At that time, this was 95, people were looking, as uh, it was explained earlier by Haruki, that the innate immune system, uh, people wanted to know how the innate, is, in, in, innate immune system could control the adaptive in, immune system. And what was known at that time is that this dendritic cell discovered by Ralf Steinmann, who got the Nobel Prize in 2011, this dendritic cell could phagocytose mi microorganism in order to activate this naive T cell here. But it was also known that in order for this naive T cell to be, f to be fully activated, you needed the expression of co-stimulatory molecules and inflammatory cytokine. And those are under the control of NF-kappa B. And what was known is that the phagocytic receptor cannot activate NF-kappa B. And so the hunt was open for a receptor here that could sense LPS or, or microbial determinant and activate NF-kappa B. Candidates uh, for this receptor were, for example, CD14, discovered by Richard Ulevich. It has leucine rich repeat, binds LPS, but as you can see, it's GPI anchor, so it cannot transduce the signal into the cell. You had also the IL1 receptor, which can activate as an NF kappa B, but obviously binds uh, interleukin 1. And we were at that time in a human frontier ground program with uh, uh, somebody called Charlie Genway, the late Charlie Genway. And when we talked about our results, he understood very quickly that in fact the toll receptor, which shared with CD14 this leucine rich repeat, and with the IL1 receptor, this intracellular tier domain, tier stands for uh, toll interleukin 1 receptor domain, this receptor could be the missing receptor that everybody was looking for. And uh, this led uh, Charlie to clone the first uh, toll-like receptor that he called human toll-like receptor, and he could show that it activates NF-kappa B. And at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, Bruce Beutler, who was uh, uh, working on these mice that are defective in LPS signaling, could show that, in fact, they carry a mutation in what is the mouse homologue of the human toll-like receptor of Charlie Genoway. And uh, you know, all know, that there was a, a huge uh, cherry on this, this discovery because uh, the human toll-like receptor was not alone but belongs to a whole family of receptors in, uh, which sense directly microbial determinant at the cell surface or in the endocytic compartment and activate then via NF-kappa B and the interferon regulatory factor, uh, the innate and the adaptive immune res response. And we have really to thank Shizu Akira, who deciphered all these pathways here and the role of these different tolls. He didn't get the Nobel Prize, and I regret it. But let me show you another outcome. We come back to the flies now. 
uh, up to that time, people always, were, were, when we talked about uh, the antimicrobial peptide in flies, they asked us, why do you work on the immune system of a tiny little fly? They are so tiny, they reproduce quickly, they do not live very long, they don't really need an immune system. But here, for the first time, we could answer this question. How important is the immune system, even for a tiny little fly? And uh, so we, we, we used here, we challenged the flies, we infected them with Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a mild pathogen for the fly. You can see here the, the, the wild type survival. And you can see that for tall minus flies, they do not express zoosomycin, the only fungal peptide. You can see now that three days after the challenge, all flies are dead. And this gave uh, the, the Nobel Prize to the former head of our lab, as, as you mentioned, uh, Jules Hoffman, uh, who got this Nobel Prize in 2011. So now let's uh, move on. Uh, so the, the you have again these two pathways. Uh, the IMD pathway is activated by gram-negative bacteria, and the TOL pathway is activated by gram-positive bacteria or by fungi and yeast. And an obvious question since the beginning was, as a toll-like receptor sends directly microbial determinant, and as we didn't have, we didn't need the, the, the early embryonic proteases to activate toll for, for drosomycin expression, the question was, do we have here a direct recognition or do we have a proteolytic cascade? And the answer to this question came through a mutant, which is often the case when you work with flies. So this mutant is called necrotic, uh, because the flies have uh, the phenotype is necrotic patches onto the cuticle, and they die shortly after hatching. So we, we cloned the, the, the gene involved in this mutation, and we discovered it, it, it is a serpene. Serpene is an inhibitor of, of serine proteases. So serpene have a very compact structure. They have here uh, n terminal loop. And this loop acts as a bait for the uh, target serine protease. So the target serine protease cleaves the loop, gets covalently linked to the serpene, and then the whole uh, complex undergoes a conformational change which destroys completely the protease. So they act like suicide substrate. So we looked at the immune system in these necrotic mutant flies, and uh, you see the result here. Uh, we use here drosomycin GFP reporter. So this is in absence of any challenge. So there is no fungal challenge. You can see that all the felt body cells light up in green, which means that the toll pathway is constitutively activated in this fly. And you can even see the black necrotic patches due to the uh, light of the GFP. And the toll pathway is constitutively activated. So this means that, yes, we must have here a a proteolytic cascade, or at least one protease, which is normally kept on the check by the next serpent. And when this serpent is absent or mutated, somehow this protease gets autocatalytically activated. And this leads to a very strong activation of the toll pathway and to the neck phenotypes and the lethality of the fly. So what are these proteases? So to make a long story short, I have one slide for, for this. This is the work of our lab and many other labs that showed the, the picture we have now of, the, of this upstream uh, of, of the toll receptor. So upstream of toll, we have a, a first protease cascade, which is centered around one protease, which is called grass. And this uh, protease um, takes uh, uh, um, a signal from the recognition molecule, the recognition molecule for microbial determinant. They are soluble uh, uh, recognition proteins based on uh, peptidoglycan recognition proteins, recognize the, the peptidoglycan from gram-positive bacteria, and the glucan binding protein, which recognize the sugars from gram-positive bacteria and from fungi. This is what we call the PAMP pathway. For those who are familiar with the plant system, uh, you know uh, uh, this pathway. The second pathway is centered around another protease that is called, we call Persephone. It's kept on the check by neck. We called it first a danger signal because it's activated much earlier th than the microbial determinant uh, pathway. Uh, and, uh, but recently we have... Um, work this out. We, we have sent, just sent the paper out for, for publication. Hope it will 
work fine. We had shown that Persephone is a direct sensor for fungal proteases and uh, 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 bacterial uh, proteolytic virulence factor. And this is very reminiscent of uh, what is called in the plant immune system uh, an effector-driven immunity. So, so far so good for the, for the tall pathway. So this is the actual picture we have of this pathway. And this is all in the open circulatory system. So soluble receptors and proteolytic cascades. Now let's go to the um, IMD pathway. So uh, our work and the, the work of many groups around the world uh, have shown that downstream of this uh, IMD pathway, um, this is the work of Dan Hultmark in, in, in Sweden, there is a, another NF-kappa-B-like molecule called Redish. It's a class one rail protein. It has to be cleaved in order to, to, to translocate into the nucleus. Uh, the upstream of Relish, there, there is a, a, a fly uh, signalosome with IKK kinases, beta and gamma. Still upstream, you have uh, uh, MAP3 kinase, TAC1, which works together with TAP2. And then you have, we cloned IMD, which is an adapter, adapter protein, has the death domain. It's a, uh, homologue to the receptor interacting protein, RIP. And as it's adapter protein, it's close to the receptor. The receptor are PGRP-LC that we discovered, and PGRP-LE that was discovered by uh, Curata-sensei here. They are receptor, so it recognizes peptidoglycan on gram-negative bacteria. And then you have the apoptotic member of the pathway, FAD, with its death domain, the fly homologue of Caspas 8, which is called DRED, and uh, IAP2, this leads to the uh, phosphorylation and the cleavage of relish. And also to make things more simple, uh, the TAC1 uh, feeds into the June kinase pathway, which feeds back into the IMD pathway. So the message here, this complex pathway, the, mes the first message is uh, if you want to remember this pathway, it's quite analogous to the TNF-alpha receptor pathway with this dichotomic way of activating NF-kappa B. And uh, the second message is that uh, we, we still don't understand mechanistically how these different players work together to activate NF-kappa uh, NF B. And so we thought that uh, we don't understand it because there are probably missing, uh, missing players here. And so we undertook uh, uh, another screen uh, this time in S2 cell culture, you have heard yesterday about S2 cell culture. So there are drosophila cells. And the whole IMD pathway, which is depicted here, is uh, functional in these S2 cells. And so this shows you the, the feasibility of the screen. So if you transfect the cells with the dominant form of the receptor, which is here, you have a very nice expression of uh, the, the reporter here is dipterysine luciferase. And if you use together a double-strand RNA against IMD, you knock it down. So we use this to screen uh, in collaboration with Michael Boutros in, in Germany. Uh, we used it to, in Heidelberg, we used it to screen the 22,000 genes in, in, the, uh, in the fly genome. And we, sorry, we ended up with a very nice candidate, uh, which is, this is a fly nomenclature, CG8580. So so far, so good. So now the first question we had, where does CG5 80, uh, CG8580 work in this uh, pathway? And so we undertook a very painful and long uh, epistatic analysis. And this shows you, for example, what we, 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 we did. So here we constructed the dominant form of IMD, which is here. You activate the pathway knock it down by a double strand RNA against IMD, and also against our gene. And so it means that CG8580, it's downstream of IMD. And then we constructed dominant forms of FAD, DRED, TAC1, and so on, and so on. And the gene was always downstream. And we didn't understand what was happening. Till we came to the end, uh, it was a very long work, where we uh, used the dominant form of relish itself, which activates the pathway, and then we knock down our gene and we reduce the activation. And then we understood finally that our gene works at the level, or downstream, or at the level of the transcription factor itself. 
And so for this reason, the, the, the postdoc who worked with me on this, who discovered this, is Japanese. And so he, he came up with the name of Akirin uh, from Akiraka Nisuru, making things clear. And I hope this is right. You, you are better judge than me. So what about this Akirin? So first, as it works at, at the level of a transcription factor, uh, we wanted to know where it works. And so we used the uh, uh, V5 tag Akirin, and you can see that we have a very nice nuclear localization, which is dependent on this nuclear localization signal here. When you abrogate it, you have a cytoplasmic location. So, so far, so good. It's in the, site, in the nucleus. So what about uh, the function in vivo? Uh, because we saw it in S2 sets. Is it also true in, in, in whole flies? So we constructed a synthetic null mutation. But the synthetic null mutation appeared to be little, embryonic little. So we had to, to use a conditional knockout. We used the transgenic flies in which you could, we could activate an RNAi. And uh, you can see uh, the, the result here. So if we challenge the, the flies with gram-negative bacterium, you have activation. This is the RT-PCR for dipterocin. And if you knock down acirin via RNAi, it goes down. So it uh, it's, uh, works also in vivo. And this correlated well with the, with the, the survival data. Because here you have the wild type survival, which challenges the flies with gram negative bacteria. Here you have a control mutation, it's a null mutation in NF kappa B, relish. And here you have the uh, knockdown of uh, acirin, and you can see the survival of the flies. So uh, it works in, uh, in vivo as it works in, in, in vitro. Uh, so we are happy now, we have a new player in this pathway, but the story is not finished. Because when we looked at the, uh, at the databases, we could see, in fact, that uh, uh, we could find acirin everywhere. So in all insects, uh, we found acirin. And you can see that in, in it's well conserved. In, in vertebrates, it duplicated. Duplicated, and we called them, we, we didn't have many a lot of imagination. We called them acirin 1 and acirin 2. And acirin 2 is more closely related to the insect acirin. So they are, f they are conserved uh, in, the, um, uh, in the sequence. So we wanted also to know if they are functionally conserved. And uh, so we came back to our S2 cells. So we use the dominant form of PGRPLC, activate the pathway, knock it down with a double strand RNA against acirin. We used here a uh, double strand RNA against the 5' UTR. And so we could rescue this phenotype by co-transfecting uh, um, uh, the open reading frame of uh, fly acirin. So you have a nice rescue of this uh, phenotype. But more interestingly, we could also rescue this phenotype, partially at least, with uh, the open reading frame of human acirin 2. And so it means that human acirin 2 and fly acirin are also uh, conserved, functionally conserved. What about the localization in human cells? So we used HeLa cells and flag tagged acirin 1 and acirin 2. And you can see again that you have a nice nuclear localization, which is again dependent on this nuclear localization signal. So what about the, the, the function in vivo? So the, the we asked uh, our friends, uh, Osamu Takeuchi, working at that time in Shizu Akira's lab, to do the knockout for us. And uh, the first results were really uh, disappointing. It's, it's experiments, as you know, are very expensive because uh, mice lacking completely acarin 1 are perfectly viable, have no phenotype. We tried everything. Uh, they swim perfectly well, for example. They do a lot of things perfectly well. And so we are disappointed. But when we looked at mice acarin 2, this time we had more luck because uh, the knockout here is embryonic lethal. And this reminds us of what we obtained for the fly acarin, which are also have an uh, embryonic lethal, lethality phenotype. But here we could use this very nice trick. We floxed out uh, the, the, the remaining uh, allele of acarin 2 using the Cree recombinase in this uh, mouse embryonic fibroblast. And then we could show that acarin 2, uh, the mouse acarin 2, is required downstream of all these uh, innate immune pathways, TNF-alpha pathway, IL-1 uh, 
pathway. Here, this is a MALP2 is agonist of TLR2. This is the TLR2 uh, pathway. LPS is agonist of TLR4. So here you have the TLR4 pathway. So acarine is uh, required downstream of all these pathways. And so we have continued to work on acarine. We wanted to know exactly how this, this works. And one observation we made at the very beginning was that uh, acarine 2 is not required for the expression of all LPS-dependent genes. And this was very interesting. Because so these are all LPS-dependent genes. But if you look, acarine is only acarine 2 is only important uh, for, for example, for IL-6 or BCL-3 here, and not for the other. So acarine 2 is required for the expression of only a subset of nf kappa B dependent genes. So we wanted to know more why. And uh, to make a long story short, we, we, saw we, we, we discovered that acarine, in fact, uh, uh, nucleates a Brahma complex, uh, chromatin remodeling complex called Brahma-BAP complex. And uh, this only on certain genes. In f for example, I had six, I told you, BCL3. And uh, very nicely, these genes that require acarine are all involved in inflammation and cancer. And uh, another subset of genes, uh, which, for example, you have uh, uh, ICAPA B zeta, which is here, are more implied in anti inflammatory effect of NF kappa B. We have shown that the same is true in, in flies. So uh, fly acarine is also required for only a subset of genes. And it requires also the Brahma complex. And this, for us, was very interesting. Because when you look at the uh, inflammatory uh, pathway, for example, the TNF alpha pathway, you know that downstream of this pathway, you have uh, an inflammatory response. But you have also a negative feedback, which is an anti-inflammatory effect on the pathway itself. And when you look at the drugs that are used uh, today uh, to against uh, as anti-inflammatory drugs, the antibodies generally, monoclonal antibodies, they all act upstream, very upstream of the pathway. And so when you shut the pathway down, it sh shuts the inflammatory rep response down, but also the negative feedback. And the ideal for an anti-inflammatory drug would be to shut only the inflammatory response and to leave this uh, uh, feedback uh, alone. And acarine 2 works exactly here. So we, we have no idea, uh, still not no idea of the structure of NF kappa B, but we of uh, acarine. But we thought that we could, uh, in fact, uh, uh, use a screen to see this, uh, uh, to find uh, something that binds and inhibits uh, acarine. And so we use this two-step screen. So you screen first for fluorescent molecules. And uh, then you get polarization of, of your target, acarine 2. And then you screen for something that displaces this. Uh, and then you get, in fact, depolarization. And so you hope you have something that can inhibit your, 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 your cell. So we did that. We screened uh, a library of 200 fluorescent compounds ended up with a compound which uh, nicely um, uh, binds to acarine with a KD of uh, approximately 4 micromolar. And then we use this uh, bound to, to this fluorescent compound bound to acarine to screen the 6,500 uh, bioactive compound of the French library. And we found one that displaces completely this thing. With a with a with a ki, ki, ki of uh, 40 micromolar, which is which is not much, I agree. But we are chemists are working on this, and uh, this compound is F11, and we, we did just this is very preliminary, but we did just a run on on on, uh, on uh, human cells, THP1, for example. Here you have IL6 secretion and CX, uh, CXX, CX CL2 uh, uh, messenger RNA. Uh, expression, you can see that when you uh, give uh, the compound F11, you have a nice reduction of the uh, it's LPS activate. It's active. The cells are activated by LPS. You have a nice reduction, and for I kappa B zeta, which is the acarine independent gene, you don't have this effect. 
And this is very preliminary. The, 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 the KI are very high, but uh, the chemists are working now to, to have a better uh, molecule with a better uh, KD. So you see what flies can bring up to, for example, to medical research. But it's an outcome. So first ask the question, the interest in science, and then it's for the students. You, you will have uh, interesting things. So uh, to, to, to finish uh, my talk, um, so I told you that uh, uh, you have two pathways that control the expression of this antimicrobial peptide. You have the, the IMD pathway, which is here, activated by gram-negative bacteria, and you have the toll pathway activated by gram-positive bacteria, fungi, and also uh, effector-driven recognizes uh, proteases. So when you look at these two pathways here, uh, you have the, the toll pathway, the IMD pathway. I, I gave color codes. I told you that uh, the, the, the toll pathway is reminiscent closely related to the TLR4 pathway here. I mean, it's uh, nicely seen with, with the color code. And the IMD pathway is uh, um, a little bit like the, the, I told you it's reminiscent of the TNF alpha receptor pathway. You see the color code. So using this, we can now draw a sort of what I could call a prototypical uh, innate immune pathway in which you would have a receptor Toll, for example, an adapter protein, then a MAP3 kinase, nf kappa B, and the effector molecules, the antimicrobial peptides. And so, and now with this prototypical uh, innate immune pathway, we can ask the question, how ancient is this pathway? How ancient is the innate immune pathway? And uh, so, I finish with the slide I had at the very beginning. So, this is, uh, again, a phylogeny of the of the animal kingdom. So here you have the very origin, one, one billion years ago, origin of multicellularity. And then you have the split between uh, triploblastic and diploblastic. Uh, the sea anemones, the sponges are here. Then the split between deuterostome and protostome, insect, worms, and the, the deuterostome. And then finally the chordates and the vertebrates are here somewhere. So with the, uh, with the uh, high throughput uh, screen, uh, sequencing, you know that we have now genomic sequences for uh, species in all these uh, classes of, of animals. And so we can ask the question, just looking at the databases, do we have, where do we have toll, for example, in these animals? And when you look at for toll, you find it everywhere. When you look for TAC1, you find it everywhere. NF kappa B is everywhere. Antimicrobial peptides can be found everywhere. It has even been shown in a very nice paper that in C. anemon, for example, this whole pathway is fully functional. And so to answer this question, when did the innate immune system appear? Uh, uh, I can say that it appeared probably one billion years ago. So I draw this animal, this first multicellular animal like a sponge, but I have no idea how it looked like. But I'm sure that it, has, uh, it had a cellular arm of the immune system because it had phagocytosis. This is the way this animal uh, eats, in fact, is, uh, for, 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 for food. And it had, we know that now, it had the complete prototypical uh, innate immune humoral pathway. And so the origin of the innate immune system probably arose with uh, multicellularity. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And just a few uh, slides for, two slides, in fact, for um, acknowledgments. So this is Jules Hoffman, who was uh, former director of our lab. Uh, he's emeritus now like me. Uh, Julien Royer discovered the PGRPs uh, in, in the lab. Bruno Lemaitre worked with me on TOL. Charles Etrud, Dominique Ferrandon, uh, he discovered the, GNP, the uh, uh, GNBPs. Akira Goto named Akirin. Uh, he worked for some time uh, with uh, Dr. Kurata in, in, in Tohoku here, and he's back in Strasbourg now, and he has an interim position. 
And uh, uh, finally, Nicolas Matt and Francois Bonnet worked on, on the Brahma complex and the uh, Achillean story. And here are our collaborator. Uh, the people who gave us money, uh, I, very often people ask me, why do you have so many sources of money? You must be very rich. In fact, not. It's for our American friends, you know, each gives a little bit money, so you have to have many sources of money. And finally, uh, the, the, our friends in Japan, so Sochi Kurata, I told you already, already about him, uh, a very good friend who helped us a lot, in, in, who was formerly in Tokyo University, the Sasakawa Sensei, and uh, uh, Uzami Takeuchi in, in, in Kyoto now. And I would like also to thank the GSPS because I had spent two months last uh, October, November in uh, Kyoto in Osamu's lab uh, thanks to a grant of the GSPS. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you